Hello everyone, I'm Jessica from PhysioQ and welcome to our workshop on heart rate variability. I'm going to quickly explain how the session will run. Uh, it should last just over an hour and it will be followed by a 15 minute Q&A session at the end. And I'd also like to encourage you all to use the chat throughout the session to ask questions. Uh, the notifications will be muted for our speaker, so don't worry, you won't be interrupting him. But for the sake of time, our PhysioQ team will be jotting down the questions during the session and Dr. On, our presenter, will answer them at the end of the session during that designated Q&A time. I do also want to remind everyone that this talk will be recorded. And before I pass it over to our wonderful speaker, I would like to give you a quick introduction to our organization for uh, just some background for those of you that are new and that don't already know us. So we are PhysioQ, we're a nonprofit organization based in Boston, and our goal is to democratize access to health research. And we do that in two different ways. So the first way is through education and engagement. So for example, running sessions like these on topics related to health research and wearable technology, and also by providing educational content via um, our new PhysioQ Academy page, which can be found on our nonprofit's website. The second way that we democratize access to health research is by creating technological tools that help support the research community. So specifically those that are using wearable technology in their work, like our product LabFront. All right, so now I'll be passing it over to one of our most ardent supporters and someone who has really helped shape it in shaping PhysioQ to uh, what it is today. Dr. Ahn is an internal medicine physician with a background in physics and engineering and physiological signal analyses. He's also an assistant professor in medicine and radiology at Harvard Medical School. Um, also a fun fact about Andrew, he was the lead medical advisor for the team Dynamical Biomarkers, the runners up winners for the famous $10 million Qualcomm X Prize tricorder competition. So we are extremely grateful to have him here today with us to share his knowledge on HRV. And Dr. Andrew on, you have the virtual floor. Welcome. Great. Thank you, Jess. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Let me see if I can share my screen real quick. No problem. Just need to stop sharing on our side. Okay, let's see. All right. So is that, can you see the, the screen? Yeah, it's perfect. Perfect. Okay. So, um, hold on. So the title of my talk is Meta Perspective on Heart Rate Variability Antiquated. Is heart rate variability antiquated or indispensable? And um, this is my quick disclosure slide. And um, the reason I titled the talk this way was to highlight the differences in views towards heart rate variability. Uh, the views that are often divided along occupational and disciplinary lines. So if you ask a, a clinician in healthcare setting, the, uh, the response you may say you get is that heart rate variability is antiquated. On the other hand, something's going on with my slides, okay. On the other hand, if you ask an athlete or a silicon entrepreneur seeking to optimize physical or cognitive performance, they may say their heart rate variability is really important um, and indispensable. Personally, as a clinician and a researcher of wearable devices, um, I find this divide really fascinating. And I'm also acutely aware that the divide is larger than many will recognize because many physicians are simply not aware that uh, heart rate variability is widely espoused as a marker of health and performance, while many athletes have little idea how skeptical the medical community may be towards heart rate variability. The other day, I was listening to a podcast on heart rate variability, and one of the speakers was saying that heart rate variability is sort of commonly used in the clinical setting for diagnostic and prognostic purposes. And I have to say, that's really not the case. And to, to show that, um, sort of indicate, to illustrate this, in the, hospital, in the hospital, we utilize something called the Xyle patch. It's an FDA-approved heart rate monitor, which can, you can keep on for up to 14 days. And when someone gets admitted to the hospital for syncope, which is loss of consciousness, chest pain, or palpitations, we send people home with this Xyle patch. And when you get the actual medical report, this is the actual medical report, uh, actually it's a sample of someone, you can see that they present a lot of the information such as heart rate events, which include arrhythmias, uh, such as ventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, sinus pauses, and various activities. 
but nowhere in there is there anything about heart rate variability. And you would think that with something like this device, uh, it, which is a perfect instrument for heart rate variability, that that would be included in this. But simply, it's not included because it's heart rate variability is not used in the clinical setting. The last time any medical professional society had put up a major position or a consensus paper on heart rate variability was in 1996. It was a joint statement placed put out by the European Society of Cardiology and the North American Society of Pacing and Electrophysiology and published in the two big journals, European Heart Journal and the Circulation Journal. And it sort of quickly went over, uh, reviewed some of the literature and provided some guidelines. They talked a little bit about the methodology of heart rate variability, included uh, time and frequency domain analysis, short-term versus long-term acquisition of heart rate uh, data, and some of the recording requirements, such as the ECG signal, the duration, the pre-processing that you needed of the signals. They also talked about the physiological correlates, uh, including autonomic influences, the frequency components, and then some of the clinical applications. Actually, they only identified two, uh, post-myocardial infarction. So you could obtain heart rate of variability one week after an acute MI. And that information was found useful to determine whether someone was at risk of arrhythmia or death. And then the, uh, the diagnosis of diabetic neuropathy. Now this was highly cited, but again, this was in 1996. The only follow-up was done uh, of this paper was done in 2015. And it talked uh, largely about nonlinear methodologies, which I won't be talking on this talk. It would be in subsequent talks um, for the series. And um, this uh, basically uh, the, the same group, uh, the European Society of Cardiology, uh, and another European Heart Rhythm Association reviewed a number of heart rate variability nonlinear methodologies publications out of 800 plus and found that 21 studies met quality criteria. And then these are sort of the various methods that were uh, evaluated, including detendrid fr uh, frequency analysis, Poincare, deceleration capacity, acceleration capacity, entropy. I'm not gonna go into too much details, but their recommendations was ultimately that traditional measures, which were discussed in the prior um, guidelines in 1996, was the, remains the method of choice. And uh, widespread use of nonlinear methods was not recommended. So this was the most recent update that was given by any sort of large medical professional society. And it was published in a much smaller journal called Europace. And it really didn't get much citations. So, um, you know, clearly, the, the importance of heart rate variability in medical establishment is in question. And so it hasn't been widely utilized. Um, um, now contrast this with how wearable companies use heart rate variability and often consider it as a cornerstone for the app functionality. So uh, Whoop is a, a well-known uh, company that has its own device and its app. And they have a measure called Whoop Recovery. And one of the cornerstone of this measurement of recovery is heart rate variability, uh, in, in addition to resting heart rate, sleep, and respiratory rate. And this enthusiasm towards heart rate variability is not limited to wearable world. In fact, heart rate variability has garnered a steady rise in interest in the actual peer-reviewed sciences. And if you do a literature search on the number of heart rate variability-related publications, you'll find that there has been a significant increase over the past three decades, even more so than you would anticipate uh, based on the rise of number of journals and the growth of science alone. So where does the truth exist and why is there such a contrast in enthusiasm here? And some of the hints as to why this growth has occurred and maybe how some of these disparities and these differences in this perspective of heart rate ability has uh, arisen from is to, to, you can take a look at the number of publications by discipline. And so what I did here was I took the number of publications divided pulling to discipline by decades. And you could see here, sorry, I'm having trouble with my mouse, is that in the 1970s, you have 157 total publications, 1980, 460, 1990s, 7,000, 2000s, about 1,500, 15,000, 
heart rate variability in 2010, about 28,000. And then just in the 2020s alone, which is just 2020 and 2021, already we have nearly 5,000 publications. And if you take a look a little bit of the patterns of uh, this heart rate variability publications, you could notice that in the beginning, the 1970s and 1980s, obstructive tissue and gynecology was the leading discipline that published in heart rate variability. And why is that? It was because fetal heart rate monitoring was um, sort of became popular and now has become the standard practice. And you could see that obstructive gynecology is no longer sort of the prominent discipline that um, publishes in heart rate variability. Then came the cardiac and cardiovascular uh, fields. And in the 1990s and 2000s, they essentially dominated uh, in publications in heart rate variability. And then the domination slowly sort of withered away and then it, they lost their lead in 2020. And if you take a look at the neurosciences, you can see that in the beginning, they're, you know, continued to be present uh, throughout the decades. But in the beginning, in the first three decades or so, a lot of the focus was on sort of autonomic nervous uh, conditions, such as diabetic neuropathy, the re innervations of transplanted hearts, and some other autonomic nervous conditions. But then later in the 2010s and 2020s, the reason it really sort of gained prominence uh, was because of the development of neuroimaging and neurotechnologies um, in the recent decades. And then you can see that engineering and biomedical came into the foray, sort of came into um, view in the 2010s and 2020s, and then sports science also became significantly important. So the goals of this talk is to appreciate how science of heart rate variability has evolved over the past 50 years, recognize the various ways heart rate variability is measured, obtain a basic understanding of heart rate variability physiology, and to understand how different perspectives of heart rate variability has emerged. And to sort of um, illustrate the way I interpret how heart rate variability has evolved over the years, um, I have put together, so sort of divided into five stages. And this is based on the prevailing scientific paradigms that existed in each of these stages. And uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to go through all of these five stages. It will probably take three talks overall to go over all of them. Um, but, you know, I think as of today, we'll just largely focus on part one, understanding heart rate variability. And uh, the stages are first understanding heart rate variability, uh, and then heart rate variability as a marker of autonomic nervous system, then heart rate variability as a marker of body-wide function, heart rate variability within the construct of mind-body interaction, and then finally the heart rate variability itself as a desirable target. So the first stage, understanding heart rate variability, happened in the 1970s and 1980s predominantly, where there was a focus in physiology and uh, development of methods. In my view, the uh, 1970s and 1980s was the golden age of physiology. Uh, about, you know, this occurred about 20 years after Hodgkin and Huxley uh, finalized their axon signal transduction along, along the squid axons. This was also 20 years after Watson Crick figured out the DNA double helix structure. And um, there was enough time for development of imaging stains, such as ELISA in 1971. Electrophysiologically, electrophysiology techniques such as voltage clamps and machines that are that were important for obtaining electrophysiological measures, neurotransmitter blockades such as atropine and propanolol, and you also have infrastructure for animal studies. So uh, it is only natural that you would you would see a significant development or advancement of our physiological understanding of autonomic nervous system around this time. And by this time, uh, by the 1970s, they really had a pretty good understanding of the autonomic nervous system. And they have divided into two divisions. Actually, there are probably three because there's the parasympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, and the third one is the enteric nervous system, which we don't talk about too much here. Um, and during the 1970s and 80s, they've pretty much outlined 
the various physiological roles that each of these nervous systems play, and also importantly understood the anatomical pathways uh, that were responsible for the execution and functions of both of these nervous systems. In regards to the heart, we knew that the parasympathetic nerves uh, slows heart rate and the sympathetic nerves increases heart rate. Now, the contracting functions of the heart um, are carried through, um, are, are coordinated basically through the uh, electrical conduction system as depicted here in blue and purple. The part that sets the pace for the heartbeats is the sinoatrial node or the SA node located in the right atrium. And it helps set the rate of the, uh, the heartbeat. The, the conduction, the electrical conductions, you have essentially pacemaker cells in the SA node, sends electrical signals down the atrium to the AV node, and then down the Purkinje's of His, the His Purkinje cells, and then down the bundles that led to the contractions of various chambers. And you, it, both the parasympathetic and the nervous, uh, sympathetic nervous system acts at the SA nodes and helps set the rate of the heartbeat. And they both have uh, sort of opposing uh, effects. The sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate, which is shown here you know, going up to 200 beats per minute. The vagal system, on the other hand, slow, uh, slows heart rate. And if you had exact uh, cancellation of each other, and if you let the heart beat intrinsically on its own, the intrinsic heart rate is about 110 to 100, uh, about 100 to 110 beats per minute. And since our resting heart rate is around 70 beats per minute, that indicates that the vagal tone is greater than the sympathetic tone at rest. And we knew that actually in the 1970s, um, and even as early as the 1950s actually, was because um, they had done some experimentations with transplanted hearts. And you could see here the heart rate over time in a healthy heart, and you can see that their average heart rate is about 71 beats per minute. And then when they transplanted the heart, uh, either in a dog or in a human, um, you could see that the heart rate was much higher, about 99 beats per minute, or even higher to 110 beats per minute. And the other thing that you know is that the variability that you see in the heart rate disappears in a transplanted heart. And the reason is that case is because the transplanted heart, in, in order to transfer that heart from a, a, from a donor to the recipient, you need to disconnect all the autonomic nervous connections to that heart. So that includes the parasympathetic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system. And so you lose this variability and you have a significant rise in your heart rate. And this was known um, as early as the 1960s because the first human cardiac transplantation was done by Christian Barner in South Africa in December of 1967. So we knew this way early on. And this is an example of sort of the complexity that you get with heart rate variability. This is RR interval, which is the inverse of heart rate. And you can see the changes in the RR interval with time or with the number of beats. And uh, the average of this graph gives you the resting beat to beat interval, or in the analogy that I would like to say is sort of like the C level. The fluctuations that you can see around this quote unquote C levels is the tides and the waves. And this is the, the heart and rate variability that we're talking about. And as early as the 1970s, clearly uh, physiologists uh, were able to identify the important factors that were involved in heart rate variability and even develop a schematic representation. And this is a pretty good representation. And this was a publication in 1973. They've identified sort of the central neural controls, which included the brainstem um, sort of uh, control centers and uh, the peripheral mechanical factors. And they even developed a schematic to help understand how these various factors interacted with each other. And um, as noted, they identified the important factors, which included the control centers of the autonomic nervous system in the brainstem, the baroreceptors, which were important for maintaining a stable blood pressure, and also the effect of breathing by changing the intrapleural pressures. 
And so they've clearly developed a, a very good understanding of this in the 1970s. And one of the important parts, uh, sort of physiological contributions to this heart rate variability is respiratory sinus arrhythmia. This is the change in your heart rate as you take a breath in and out. And you may notice as you breathe in, your heart rate, which is sort of um, illustrated here by the gray, increases with in inspiration or inhalation, and it goes down with exhalation. And there are certain sort of time, dynamical time parameters or information about this. The typical time scales is about every three to seven seconds that you take a breath or about nine to 24 cycles per minute. So this is the respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And then the other important physiological factor in heart rate variability is the barrel reflex. Barrel reflex is a way to control or stabilize blood pressure. And you have essentially these mechanical receptors located in the aorta and the carotid sinus. And then through the vagus nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve, you have signals sent to the brainstem. And then this brainstem signals then get sent to the, the autonomic nervous system nuclei, including the parasympathetic and the sympathetic systems. And then they feed back that response so that affects the SA node and other regions of the heart. The time scale for the bare reflex is a little longer. It's about three to 20 seconds, and it happens to be greatest probably approximately about six cycles per minute or every 10 seconds. And around this time in the 1970s, in order to capture these variability dynamics, physiologists began to create multiple measures. And it's very hard to see sort of this in, in sort of granular detail here, but what's important to note is already by the 1970s, they've established important time domain measures and frequency domain measures. And this is a summation of the multiple heart rate variability measures that are out there in the literature right now. This was in Schaefer in 2017. These are sort of highlighting the most important ones. There are at least 60 to 70 different heart rate variability measures now. Um, and they're categorized into three big uh, buckets. One is heart rate variability by the time domain measures. The second is heart rate variability by frequency domain measures. And the third one is nonlinear measures. And I'm gonna talk about each of these in a little more detail. The first one, the first category that I wanna talk about is the frequency domain. And the way I want to help you understand how this works is to sort of imagine light. Um, so if you take prism and then you shine white light onto it, then the prism actually breaks down the white light into its different components of, uh, sort of spectral light. Um, and it's, you know, the, the prism based on its ability to sort of, um, you, you have different speed of light uh, secondary to the refraction within the prism. And as a result, it divides the light into its different frequencies. And you could imagine that if you had a photo sensor in this wall and you let that photosensor accumulate the amount of light that goes onto that sensor, over time, you will develop an idea of how strong each of these uh, individual components uh, of light are. You could do the same thing with heart rate time series. And we use different uh, techniques and, and sort of analogous to the prism, you have something called Fourier transform and autoregressive sp spectrum analysis. There are some others as well. And what these techniques do is that it, it permits us to um, identify the spectral power, power each frequency range. So you can imagine this heart rate variability is composed of multiple signals with different uh, frequencies. And these techniques enables us to sort of divide them and to identify which component is the strongest. And what you see here is you can essentially produce uh, a spectral power. And you can see that the spectral power is divided um, according to the frequency. Now frequency, the higher it is, that means the faster the cycle. So the higher frequency is on the right here and the lower frequency is on the left. 
And over time, they have, we've got a pretty good understanding of the various categories of the cycles of the frequencies that are involved in heart rate variability. And we've divided them into several categories. There's high frequency, low frequency, very low frequency, and ultra low frequency. Uh, and then we have an, a ratio of lower frequency versus higher, high frequencies. And the, the frequencies that are associated with each of these frequency ranges are listed here. The ones that I want to uh, have you pay attention to is the high frequency and the low frequency. So high frequency is 0.15 to 0.4 hertz, which is about nine to 24 cycles per minute. Uh, low frequency is three to nine cycles per minute. Very low frequency is 25 seconds to five minutes per cycle, five minutes to 24 hours for the ultra low frequencies per cycle. And um, in order to evaluate these cycles, you would need to acquire the heart rate over time. And uh, because these cycles are shorter, uh, high frequency, low frequency, oftentimes you just need five minutes in order to get information about these cycles. Whereas for longer um, cycles, you would definitely need to require as, as long as 24 hours. And each of these cycles are associated with, have, have a physiological significance. So high frequency is associated with respiratory sinus rhythmia. The low frequency is associated with bare reflex and vascular sympathetic nerves. Um, and there's something called Mayer waves, which is the oscillations, the intrinsic oscillations that you see in the vessels um, when I'm talking about the artery system. Very low frequencies have slower um, physiological systems involved, such as temperature regulation, hormones such as renin engine tension, thyroxine, reproductive hormones, and steroids. And then the heart has an intrinsic nervous system as well, which is believed to have a very low frequency range. And then at the ultra low frequency range, it involves thermoregulation, other hormones such as cortisol and growth hormones, and the circadian rhythm. And they knew a lot of this um, as early as the 1970s. And this is a publication in ergono ergonomics. Um, and uh, again, they have uh, sort of created this frequency uh, spectral analysis of heart rate variability. And I'm going to read this to you because it may be small on your screen, but they have already noticed that the respiratory activity is largely predominantly near 0.35 hertz, which falls into our high frequency range. The vasomotor activity lies in the 0.1 hertz, which lies in the low frequency range and thermal activity at 0.025 hertz, uh, which is in the very low frequency range. So already they knew this in the 1970s. And um, one, thing to, uh, one thing that you'll come to uh, realize is that the high frequency of the spectral power of heart rate, heart rate uh, variability is, uh, is associated with the parasympathetic system whereas the low frequency is associated with both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic uh, nervous system. And I'm gonna to explain to you why that is. So um, in the SA node, which is, as we know, the pacemaker, oh, sorry, a bit of lag, okay. There are four important ion channels on the SA node cell membranes. You have, the sodium channel, potassium channel, uh, actually two potassium channels, and a calcium channel. And uh, within the cell, it, it is electrically negative relative to the outside of the cell. And so there's a 65 millivolt difference um, so that uh, the inside is 65 millivolts lower than the outside of the cell. So when you have positive ions move across the cell membranes, through the ion channels, it neutralizes or, or decreases this electrical potential difference. And so what you say, what we say is that it depolarizes the, the cell membrane or the cell. On the other hand, if you have potassium channels, which goes in the opposite direction, it enhances this polarization or it repolarizes or hyperpolarizes the cell membrane. And this is sort of a diagram to illustrate this. So you have uh, 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 a measurement of the voltage potential difference across the cell membrane. And as it goes up uh, it, you know, from negative 65 millivolts to zero and even positive uh, 
potential difference, it's depolarization. And as it goes down, it's repolarization. The sodium channel um, has what's called a leaky current. And this leaky current causes um, a depolarization, a very slow depolarization of the cell membrane. And uh, what happens is that slowly as it reaches a threshold, um, as denoted by this dashed line here, it causes the calcium channel to open up. And this causes a rush of calcium channels into the cell and then actively leads to depolarization of the SA node cells. Subsequently, the potassium ch channels open up and then it leads, reverses this polarization, this depolarization that is caused by both the sodium and calcium channels. And you get repolarization as denoted by this downslope of this potential difference. Now, taking this within the context of the autonomic nervous system, you could see how the autonomic system affects this pacemaking ability of the cell. So the parasympathetic nervous system involves uh, the acetylcholine coming from the postganglion of the parasympathetic nervous system, binding to the M2 or the muscarinic receptor, activating the G protein, which then subsequently activates this potassium-associated acetylcholine channel. And because this is a potassium channel that goes in the direction that enhances the polarization, what it does is that during the stage of this slow leak of this uh, sodium channel, it leads to this very slow rise of the depolarization. Now this is, uh, in the dashed line, is what is considered a normal heart rhythm. So if there was no intervention from either the sympathetic or, or the vagal system or the parasympathetic system, you would have this type of automaticity of uh, the electrical potential. But with the vagal nerve, it slows this depolarization and subsequently leads to a slower heart rate. Essentially, you're not having firing of these cells happening more frequently. The sympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, operates through norepinephrine or epinephrine that binds to the beta-1 receptors. The beta-1 receptors then bind to adenylocyclase, which converts ATP to cyclic AMP. And the cyclic AMP hastens or enhances this leaky current uh, in the sodium channel. And this leads to a rise of this depolarization, this steady leak, and then leads to a faster polarization or faster heart rate. The other thing that it does is that the cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A, then activates potassium channels and calcium channels. So what it does is it increases the depolarization, the fast depolarization and fast repolarization. So it enables a faster beating of the heart. So why am I harping on this? And why am I bothering you with all these de details? Because it's really important to know this physiology, to understand what you're, about, what you're seeing when you're obtaining the heart rhythms uh, that you get from your various devices. The SA node is where both the parasympathetic ner nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system meet. And so we can gain insights in the activities of the autonomic nervous system based on the heart rate over time. And what we look at is the interbeat interval interval or the RR interval. So this is an example of a EKG of a normal sinus rhythm. And we have, we designate the RR interval. So R indicates the peak of this QRS segment. And then we identify the RR interval, the time between these intervals. And then we can obtain a calculation of graph, which I had shown before of the RR interval over time to get a better sense of what is happening with the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. What happens though, if you have a, um, okay. So what happens, however, when you have preatrial contractions, where you have uh, contractions that's happening at not only the SA nodes, but also in the uh, other parts, ectopic sites of the right atrium? You would see that the RR is designated here, but 
does the RR interval actually provide any information about the autonomic nervous system? And what happens if you have a, uh, something called atrial fibrillation, where you have multiple ectopic sites throughout the right atrium and sometimes the left atrium that leads to this erratic heart rhythm? And what we recognize is that because a lot of these extra nodes occur outside the SA node, we consider them as noise and not reflective of what's happening in the autonomic nervous system. So um, the important thing to note is that heartbeats originating from the SA node are the only ones that provide sufficient insights into the parasympathetic nervous system and sympathetic nervous system. And to, to delineate what are sort of the normal rhythms through the SA nodes, we change R into Ns or normal rhythms. And the way we know on an EKG, whether it's a normal rhythm or not, is we can see something called a P wave before this QRS. You can see these P waves. And these P waves are the electrical contractions or electrical signals going through the right atrium. And we know through the axis or the morphology, how it's shaped, that it's going through the right system. In the periatrial contractions, we notice that the normal sinus rhythms are occurring here because we see the P waves here. We don't necessarily see the P waves that occur before these preatrial contractions. And as a result, we eliminate these R waves. And sometimes what we do is we interpolate the N between the normal ones to get an idea of what the SA node would have done if it hadn't been for these ectopic beats. For atrial fibrillation, on the other hand, it's so inundated by all these signals that are coming from uh, these other parts of the right atrium that we can't get enough information in the SA node. So we can't really get much of uh, information in patients with uh, um, atrial fibrillations about their autonomic nervous system. So this is something that you can get from your EKG. However, um, in many of you, we're getting um, heart rhythms from use of watches. And the watches don't use, you know, obtain EKGs. What we obtain are the PPGs, or the photoplethysmography, which measures the flow through microvasculatures in your skin. And um, it has, you know, it doesn't have this rapid upstroke that you can see in the electropolization. It's a slow rise. And the other thing to note is that you can't tell whether these things are normal sinus rhythms or whether they are attributed to an ectopic beat. I mean, you can't directly because there isn't a P wave in a, you don't have a P wave equivalent in the PPG signals. Um, this actually is not a P wave, it is a reflective uh, pulse wave, so it's not a P wave. So this is one of the challenges that you may encounter as you do your research, is that the PPGs uh, won't give you information about what, or directly won't give you information about what kind of rhythm you have. And sometimes if someone has a lot of ectopic atrial beats or atrial fibrillation, it falsely gives you a higher heart rate variability, um, and it doesn't give you a reflection of your autonomic nervous system. The next thing I wanted to, the reason um, that this diagram is really important is to really give you an understanding of the dynamics of the SA node. The, in the SA nodes, the acetylcholine receptor operates very quickly. So the acetylcholine, after it binds to the M2 receptor, the G protein acts literally in few milliseconds to activate this potassium ion channel. On the other hand, the sympathetic nervous system, uh, it has to, it's intermediated through this enzyme called adenyl cyclase. And this cyclase operates at much slower time scales, approximately three seconds or more. And as a result, um, it is much slower to respond. The other thing to note is that there are different dynamics in the neurotransmitters associated with each of these autonomic nervous system branches. The parasympathetic nervous system utilizes acetylcholine, and you know, the sympathetic nervous system utilizes norepinephrine or epinephrine. And the acetylcholine, when it's released from uh, this bulb of the preganglionic neuron, it is a, a quickly eliminated by abundant presence of acetylcholinesterase within the gap junction. 
On the other hand, the sympathetic nervous system has to not has to uptake these uh, norepinephrine within the gap junctions. And the time scales are much different. So the parasympathetic nervous system removes these things about every you know, 0.2 seconds, whereas the sympathetic nervous system removes it in 20 seconds. And what this leads to is a very different is a very different dynamic for each of these branches of the nervous system. For the parasympathetic nervous system, they've done this in dogs, is they've stimulated the vagal nerve. And you can see the stimulation right here. They essentially give seven hertz electrical stimulation for about 22 seconds. And right away, you can see that the beats per minute or the heart rate significantly decreases. Uh, and almost immediately after you initiate the stimulation. And the moment it stops, you stop the stimulation, the heart rate jumps back up, nearly close to its original heart rate rhythm. And the same after you do the second stimulation. And so the parasympathetic has a rapid onset, quick execution, and a short recovery time. The sympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, when you're delivering 20 hertz stimulation to the sympathetic nerve and take a look at the heart rhythm, you can see that it doesn't kick in right away. There's a little bit of a lag, about seven seconds or so, from the initiation of electro stimulation and then the rise of the heart rate. And this rise in the heart rate is not immediate like you see in the, the vagal uh, system, but it's very slow. And after you stop the stimulation, there is also a lag and it's a very slow recovery time. So the sympathetics has a delayed onset, slow execution and a long recovery time. So what does this mean? Is that when we're breathing and are breathing at every you know, three to seven seconds or nine to 24 cycles per minute, we're operating in the high frequency range. And as noted, parasympathetic nervous system is the only one that really is able to operate in the higher frequency range due to its dynamics. Quick onset, quick execution, rapid execution, rapid recovery time, whereas the sympathetic nervous system is simply too slow. So when you have something like respiratory sinus arrhythmia, the changes in your heart rate with respirations, it's predominantly a parasympathetic phenomenon. And it's simply due to the fact that the SA node has a filter, which, which inhibits the, SA, the sympathetic nervous system to operate at a faster frequency. So the question for you is, what causes relative tachycardia during expiration then? So we know that if you breathe in, you have a rise in your heart rate. As you breathe out, you have a decrease in your heart rate. So if it's not, because I had heard on a podcast someone saying that as you breathe in, you inhale, this directly stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, and this is how you get a rise in your heart rate. We know that's not true based on our understanding of physiology. In fact, what happens is, is that actually your parasympathetic nervous system is withdrawn. And we, we know this is there, there was a recent study done by Ottaviani in the Journal of Physiology in 2020. And they've actually done this in human, uh, live human beings where they inserted a uh, insulated electrode needle into the vagus nerve. And you know, I'm surprised they were able to find volunteers for this because it's a relatively dangerous procedure because the vagus nerve is right by the carotid artery in the internal jugular vein. But they were able to do it. They found three volunteers. Actually, I think they were the study investigators. And they were able to measure the number of um, sort of the uh, activations of the vagus nerves. And you could see here by the, uh, by the instantaneous frequency, uh, basically the number of stimulations that you get per second. And you could, they measured it with in respiration. And so as they, as they're expiring, the vagus nerve is active, but when they're inspiring, the vagus nerve is silenced. And so that's where you get the rise in your heart rate. And so you see this cycle as you breathe in and out. So the relative tachycardia that occurs during inspiration is due to withdrawal of the vagal nervous activity and not to increase or enhance sympathetic nervous activity. Now, does this mean that there are no respiratory components in the sympathetic nervous system? 
And the answer is actually no. Um, in human beings, you can insert a little electrode into uh, the deep coronal nerves and obtain the sympathetic nervous activities. And this is an example of this. And you can see sort of the heart rate as uh, represented by the blood pressure here. And you can see the heart rhythms manifested in the, or shown in the sympathetic nervous system activities. But you could also see a respiratory component in here. And um, if you decide to really directly measure electro, uh, the sympathetic nervous system, either with a deep perennial nerve, uh, recording, which is invasive, or using electrical electrodermal skin conductance, you could um, see here that, um, uh, you know, this is a study that was uh, published by MIT. They took five deep breaths, evaluating the electrodermal skin conductions. You could already see these five deep breaths. And, and the, the, I, I forgot to mention that the sweat glands are operated by the sympathetic nervous system. So when you have these inspirations, it activates the sympathetic nervous system, which enhances or increases the sweat gland activity, and that increases conductivity. And so that's what you see of the uh, in this in this graph here. So the fact is, there are respiratory components in sympathetic nervous system. However, the SA neuro no, again filters out the faster processes, the faster activities that are greater than 0.15 hertz. And so the only thing that you see in regards to the heart rhythm, because of this AC node filter, is the slower activity of the sympathetic nervous system. The qu next question, so what happens if you breathe slower than seven beats per minute? Now that leads to the RSA, the respiratory sinus rhythmia, then moving into the low frequency range. And so this respiratory influence effect onto this, on the SA node now has now a both a parasympathetic nervous system and a sympathetic nervous system component because it is slow enough to be, uh, to invoke the sympathetic nervous system. And when you are at the slower range, it enables this RSA effect to subsequently work with the barrel reflex, which operates around the same range and the vasomotor oscillations. And through the heart rate and blood pressure interactions, it causes what's called this coherent or the resonant state. And if you see in this graph here, which put out by heart math, you see sort of normal respirations and you can see uh, sort of the, the various heart rhythms and the blood pressures, but the moment you uh, set to a 10 second breathing rhythm or 0.1 Hertz, you see this locking in of the frequency locking of all the, the time series, uh, not only of respiration, heart rate and blood pressure as well. And some argue that this is an important way to retrain your autonomic nervous system. Um, I don't know the detail of the literature behind that quite yet, um, but you know some have uh, suggested that this resonant system is why meditation, breathing at slower uh, rates are really beneficial to your health. The final thing I wanted to mention in according to this graph was that there is something called a bagel break. And when there is stimulation of the, the acetylcholine muscarinic receptor, there is a part here that inhibits the sympathetic, the adenylyl cycling, cyclase that's part of the sympathetic nervous system. And so you have what's called a vagal break. And the reason this is important is that this is related to the question, how does the heart respond acutely to stress? When I learned about this physiology of the SA node, it sort of baffled me because it goes against my instinct of what would happen from an evolutionary standpoint. You would think that if you have a flight or flight response associated with a sympathetic nervous system, that it would need to act quite rapidly and need to, you know, so that you respond to the threat or alarm uh, immediately. So 
How does this explain um, our ability to respond rapidly um, to an acute stress? And this was assessed uh, by a study in psychophysiology in the 1980s. They took about 20 Norwegian uh, undergraduate college students and they put them to a task of uh, doing a video game with or without an electric shock. So this electric shock was a threat uh, when they did poorly on this video game. And you can see here um, these graphs on the heart rhythm and the RSA or the respiratory sympathetic arrhythmia. You can see that at rest, their heart rate is relatively low, but when they have this threat, their heart rate jumps up. And uh, actually what they did is they randomized to either getting the shock first, you know, video game with shock, uh, either first or last. Uh, and then uh, conversely, whether you get the elect uh, video game without shock, or um, on the second task. And then for the respiratory sinus arrhythmia, what we see is that in the beginning, the respiratory sinus arrhythmia at rest is relatively high. In other words, their parasympathetic system is activated. And then with this threat, uh, this RSA quickly goes down uh, and is sustained uh, through their second task. So the heart responds to an acute stress by removing the vagal break. And the sympathetic nervous system is simply to respond to, um, to these, uh, acutely to these stress. And I think it makes sense from a physio physiological standpoint why that is. It's because um, the sympathetic nervous system does require a lot of metabolic resources and a lot of energy to make this happen. So if, they, if the sympathetic nervous system responded to every little threat, then it would be uh, highly emotionally draining, or not emotionally, uh, probably emotionally, but also physically draining to the organism. So um, the vagal system has acted as the immediate acute uh, uh, function or mechanism uh, for addressing a, uh, a, stress, a stressful situation. And this goes back to the prior slides, which shows that at rest, we have a larger parasympathetic tone, uh, accounting for the slower heart rate than you would see uh, for an intrinsic uh, heart rhythm. And this gives us a little bit of a buffer. So if you have a higher parasympathetic tone, and if you encounter a stress, you are, enable this parasympathetic nervous system to subsequently deactivate and enable the sympathetic nervous system to kick in. Um, and you can understand why this tone is important. Now, if you don't have this tone, if this parasympathetic nervous system is constantly inactivated or lacks uh, significant activity, when you encounter a stressful uh, situation, you don't have significant, that significant tone reserve to, to inhibit so that you're able to address that stressful situation acutely. So I think this is one of those things that it's important to know uh, when we're evaluating the subsequent clinical studies or some of the physiological or psychological studies and why the parasympathetic nervous system has, is so important. Now we have a little bit of time to quickly go through the time domain. And as I mentioned before, we're not focusing on the RR interval, but the NN interval, interval, the normal rhythms that are associated with the SA modes. And the four big ones that I want you to pay attention with, there are various others, but the ones that are, you know, account for the majority of time domain measures in the literature out there are these four. The standard deviation of NN intervals, the standard deviation of five minute averages of the NN intervals, the root mean square of successes and N intervals differences, and then PNN 50, which is the percentage of N intervals that are greater than 50 milliseconds different than its prior N intervals. And each of these sort of require a certain amount of time. Um, I think for, uh, for these, uh, for these, uh, the RMSSD, PNN50, uh, you are, you could use up to five, minute, five minutes. Some have used as little as one minute for RMSSD. Uh, 
um, for standard deviation of in an interval and SDA and N, uh, I think a lot of them have used 24 hours. Um, and the clinical significance I will talk about a little bit later. So um, if you take a look at the in an interval over time, you can see a lot of this variability. And um, the two of the four time domain measures takes a look instead at the successive differences in the NN intervals. And it's basically the difference between the R NN interval compared to the prior one. And this is how it looks like here. So if it if your beat was 50, if your heart rate was about you know, 50 beats per minute on one time, and then it subsequently was or let's just say it was 50, uh, 80 milliseconds for the first NN interval, then it was 90 seconds on the subsequent interval, and then you have a 10 millisecond difference between the two. That's what they use in order to put out this time series. And you can see that this time series, it eliminates a lot of this slower dynamics that you see in the NN interval. And you see a lot of the faster process that occurs. And so R MSSD, which is the root mean square of, SS, uh, of this graph here, and PNN 50, which is the number of times that you have the uh, successive differences go either above or below these thresholds, um, are an indication of these more rapid events because you lose the, a lot of the slower components of your heart variability when you evaluate the successive differences in inter intervals. So when you're dealing with these measures, you're dealing with the faster components of your heart rhythm. And so you're talking about high frequency heart rate variability or the respiratory sympathetic arrhythmias, which we recall is largely a parasympathetic system uh, a phenomenon. So the question is, what are the physiological processes uh, most correlated with SDNN or the standard deviation of the NN interval? And the answer is, it really depends on the duration of the data. For two minutes, because we're doing predominantly with high frequency information or variability, the standard deviation SDNN uh, reveals or represents much more RSA or parasympathetic nervous activity. For five minutes, you are invoking both the left, uh, both uh, the low frequency and high frequency components. So you have both the parareflex reflex and the RSA physiological processes within that uh, signal. And then when you're talking about the 24-hour SDNN, it is predominated by much slower processes, and you can see that by the spectral power of each of uh, these frequency ranges. You can see that high frequency, low frequency generally has lower power. And so uh, for the lower frequencies, the very low and ultra low frequencies, they have a much higher power representation in this power spectrum. So when you're obtaining a 24 hour standard deviation, a lot of the variability is accounted by these slower rhythms. And so it's re it, it represents the, uh, the SDNN of 24 hours represents these circadian or slower hormonal processes. So in summary, these two measures, which rely on the successive NN intervals, RMSSD, PNN50, represent high frequency heart rate variability or respiratory sinus arrhythmia, and so uh, indicates much more of a parasympathetic nervous activity. SDNN depends on the duration the shorter that it is, it's more correlated with the higher frequency ranges. And then SDA and then here associates more with the circadian rhythm. So that is basically the end of the part one of this heart rate variability deep dive. And just to summarize, 1970s and 80s saw the major advances in heart rate variability physiology and measures at rest parasympathetic nervous tone uh, normally is greater than the sympathetic nervous system tone. And heart rate variability uh, frequency domain uh, for each frequency range is associated with a specific physiological process. High frequency is associated with RSA uh, or the parasympathetic nervous system. 
Lower frequency is associated with barrel reflex and basal motor, which are both have both a, a parasympathetic and a sympathetic component. And the ultra low frequency deals with hormonal or circadian rhythms. And high frequency heart rate variability correlates with vagal parent sympathetic nervous system and the faster SNS activity is filtered out at the SA node. For the time domain measures, RMSSD and PNN50 correlate with high frequency high, uh, heart rate variability and therefore uh, represents, are uh, represented by the parasympathetic nervous system and SDNN depends on the duration of the time series analysis. Now, uh, because there's so much information here, uh, there's probably gonna be two or three more subsequent talks on, on heart rate variability. And some of the things that I will talk about in the future will be the clinical studies, uh, some of the physiological tests that are used um, to assess autonomic nervous system, uh, nonlinear measures, and some of the applications of heart rate variability in psychological uh, situations such as stress and, and, and sleep as well. So that's it. And that's, it's time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahn. That was great. Um, yeah, so we're going to jump into our Q&A section now. Um, I'm looking at the chat, and it looks like your talk was extremely clear, and there was no questions that I'm seeing. Um, but I'll give, you know, I'll give our attendees a few seconds or even a minute to think of any questions they have, and you're free to ask away. And if you have a question that pops up later, that's also fine. You can email us at support at physioq.org. I'll write it in the chat and um, ask your question then. So that is the email that you can feel free to send your questions to. And I'm going to ask you, Dr. Ahn, to stop sharing your screen if you don't mind. And I'm going to jump on and just introduce the next session quickly. Yeah, I'm trying to do that. Let me see how I can do that. Awesome. Oh, here it is. And I do want to thank everyone for coming as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Ahn, for doing this session for us. It's amazing. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you so much to everyone for joining. I'm seeing a question pop up. So uh, Dr. Ahn, it says, will the presentation be available on our website? Um, I think that's a question more for us. Um, we, yes, we will be posting it since there's going to be a follow-up session as well. We'd love for, you know, people to have access to this. Um, it's a free workshop. So yeah, we will be posting it on YouTube on our uh, channel. Dr. Ron, I'll read you the next question. I'm not sure if you have the chat in front of you, but there is another question popping up. It says, besides the frequency domain and time domain, are there any other series? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's the nonlinear uh, measures of heart rate variability, which I briefly talked about uh, in one of the slides. And, you know, those include a lot of the things that were, you know, developed in the 2000, 2010s, actually as early as the 1990s. Uh, you know, it includes detrended fluctuation analysis, Poincare analysis, um, multi-scale entropy. Those are uh, a lot of the measures that are really complex, and I probably won't spend too much time on them, but it's, you know, it gives you a good sense. It, it's supposed to give a, a universal holistic uh, understanding of heart rate variability. And I'll probably talk, touch on that on the next talk. Great, thank you so much. I'm seeing some more questions popping up. That's great. So we have another one. What's the main challenge for HRV to be used clinically in your opinion? Yeah, that's one of the things that I'll touch upon in the next talk. Um, the challenge in, with heart rate variability is that it is quite sensitive to a number of um, factors. Like if you're stressed, if you've even drink, drank coffee, or if you had a bad sleep the night before, um, those are all things that lead so that can affect heart rate variability. So heart rate variability is highly sensitive. And in the clinical setting, we often consider those factors as noise. And that's why we generally try to, I mean, I think that's why heart rate variability is not uh, commonly used. It's just that it is highly sensitive and makes it hard for us 
um, to utilize it. Um, uh, and when they do use it, it's under very controlled settings, but I will talk about that in the next setting. All right, we're looking forward to it. I'm seeing one more question, lots of praise, well done. Uh, the, the question I'm seeing here says, does it mean sympathetic activity cannot be captured by frequency or time domain analysis of HRV? Well, um, yes, you can get sympathetic activity from frequency analysis, but it isn't, I mean, it's not a direct measure. So when you're talking about low frequency, um, where, you know, people have equated uh, in part with sympathetic nervous system, it's, um, it has a sympathetic nervous system component in it, but it's not totally clean. There are uh, some vagal or parasympathetic system involved in there as well. Um, and this is where I think sometimes what you have to do is you um, give a little bit of an intervention. Uh, you know, for instance, we know that the sympathetic nervous system is activated when you go from a supine or laying down state to a standing up state. So you do these little interventions that we know impact the sympathetic nervous system. And you see how that affects your frequency domain analysis. Um, so that's how they do it. It, it. Sadly, it's there isn't a really great measure to directly measure sympathetic nervous activity using heart rate variability. But this is why I briefly mentioned sort of the electrodermal measures, which may be a more direct measure of sympathetic nervous system. For the time domain analysis, uh, you know, that has a lot of issues when it comes to sympathetic nervous system. So I do not use time domain for uh, evaluating sympathetic nervous activity. Great, Andrew, I'm gonna read the next question to you. Okay. Um, how long should a baseline measure be using PPG for HRV? So this is from Joe Brandenburg. He says at Penn State, we are currently looking at intervention implementation based on live readings of HRV. And we are trying to decide where an individual is stressed relative to an accurate measure of their resting HRV. I mm -hmm. know there are a number of papers that outline standards for HRV using ECG, but none that I'm aware of giving general guidelines for wearable HRV research? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that I could, you know, spend a lot of time going into much more detail. But um, generally, uh, when you're talking about an intervention, whether it's some kind of stressful task or something like that, um, and, you know, then, it, you know, I would say a, a, a few minutes uh, would even be sufficient for that, um, even for PPG. And the reason is, uh, and, I think what's commonly used is RM SSD uh, in those situations um, when you have, you know, because the RM SSD uh, assesses the parasympathetic nervous system and when you're stressed, that parasympathetic nervous system is deactivated and you see that as a reduction in the RM SSD. Uh, even in the pulse to pulse uh, rhythm that you get in these wearable watches. The challenge though is if you know, oftentimes when you're doing these types of studies, they're done in healthy individuals. Um, but if you're dealing with people with chronic medical conditions, those who have heart disease, such as coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, or at baseline have atrial fibrillation, it's just really hard to use any type of wearable device um, to assess um, whether that individual um, is stressed or not. Because there's a lot of ectopic beats um, that don't go through the SA node. And as a result, the information that you get through the PPG is not representative of the autonomic nervous system. So that's what I would say. And what I would probably also recommend is you can get um, a baseline EKG, uh, which is not that hard to do. In fact, PhysioQ, I think, works with Polar. And Polar is another type of device that you can utilize. And you could just do that to uh, obtain a baseline EKG to see whether that person, uh, that um, volunteer, for instance, has a lot of ectopic beats. And if there is, then you probably don't want to utilize PPG uh, for uh, assessing stress response. So I hope that sort of answers the question. It's a little long. Thank you so much. There's one more question I'm gonna ask before we uh, wrap up. As you mentioned, there are many subtypes of HRV. Which one is the best or most important that can imply clinical application? Does the wearable device measure um, since it interprets PPG? Yeah, that's a good question. Again, that's something that I will talk about in the next talk or next se seminar series. Um, 
Interestingly, a lot of the clinical studies have used a, a number of heart rate variability measures, and this is what makes this literature so hard to uh, decipher. It's because there are so many different measures uh, and used in different settings. In general, um, the, the ones that are most commonly used are for time domain is RMSSD, uh, PNN50, which were used in the older clinical studies, and occasionally standard deviation or SDNN, uh, standard deviation of the NN intervals. And um, what was really interesting is in the public health studies, like the epidemiological studies, the ones that was most useful or imparted information about prognostic, prognosis, like if one was more you know, at risk of mortality, it was the very low frequency component of the heart rate variability that was the most important. Um, and so that, that is something that you know, is just not you know, emphasized in a lot of the things that we see in sort of the wearable research field. So um, it's not a straightforward question. Uh, I wish I could, I could give a better answer for that, but you know, it's one of those topics that I should hopefully address in the next talk. All right, I think that just about wraps up our, oh, there's one more question, <laughs> just kidding. Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll allow it. Um, is there a correlation between HRV and oxygen saturation level? No, not directly. Um, so oxygen, so heart rate variability is basically um, the change in um, the heart rhythm. So, uh, you know, how fast or slow the heart beats. Oxygen saturation deals with the amount of oxygen that's within the blood. And um, the way you obtain heart rate variability, like just to say for a wearable device, um, the wearable device uses a single frequency light. It's often green because green is the, the light that's used to reflect off the hemo hemoglobin um, in the blood system. And so you have one light that's shown um, in uh, from the watch. You can see that there's a green light that comes off the back of the watch. Um, it uses that one light in order to uh, assess rhythm. So you can see how much flow that goes through uh, the small vessels to um, determine how fast your heart is beating. Oxygen saturation, on the other hand, requires two frequency of lights because you, that's the way you could determine, you sort of back calculate how much oxygen is in the system. So um, the oxygen saturation uh, functionality in, in wearables are require much more battery. So you don't see that in all uh, wearable devices. And so it could, you know, it can wear off the battery life uh, for your, your device. It provides a, a completely different information, in other words. Um, so um, that's something that, you know, certainly I could talk in the future as well, but it's probably not going to be part of the heart rate variability series. All right. So thank you so much, Dr. On again. We really appreciate it. Thank you for everyone else for joining us today. I do want to steal another 30 seconds of your time. If you don't mind, I've just launched a poll. There's two questions. If you could please complete this little feedback survey, that would really help us uh, be able to better tailor these kinds of sessions to you in the future. We're always looking to provide relevant and helpful information. So your feedback is invaluable. It's all anonymous and we'd really appreciate it. And I also wanna state that um, this is the end, we're wrapping up, but we will also be on after once we say bye. So we'll be on for another few minutes to have a chat, or if you have any additional questions, you're free to ask those. Um, and if you have any questions about our organization, you're also free to stick around and connect. Aside from that, I'm seeing a lot of answers in the poll. Thank you so much. Um, other than that, I will say thank you so much for coming again. Have a wonderful Monday and goodbye everyone.